Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. I caught my fiance using my debit card without my permission to purchase stuff on Amazon for his brother. After that, am I the jerk for leaving a wedding early as a bridesmaid and causing the wedding to get charged a $500 cleanup fee? And after that, am I the jerk for lashing out at my ex-husband for wanting to move away with his girlfriend and my kids? Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen does not get to use someone else's debit card. I prefer credit cards to be honest. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. I caught my fiance using my debit card without my permission to purchase stuff on Amazon for his brother. My fiance's brother, Chris, moved to Mississippi from our hometown two years ago to be with some girl he met on the internet. Chris has always been the type to make terrible life choices and my fiancé is always the one who bails him out, with the exception of my future mother-in-law. My fiancé does this because he has survivor's guilt. They lived with their father growing up and their father hated Chris for whatever reason but loved my fiancé, Heath, so Heath saw a lot. Yes, they both got out, but Chris was ruined, refuses therapy, gets into trouble constantly, etc. He's 33 and my fiancé is 28. So when Chris left to go to Mississippi, I was working at the hospital 70 hours a week while Heath stayed home with the kids. He had no income, but he was a stay-at-home dad and this worked for us. However, I started noticing money going missing quite often and when I checked the bank statements, Heath handled them because he was an accountant for a couple years and better at budgeting, I noticed a ton of Amazon purchases and money transfers through Facebook pay. When I confronted him, he told me his brother and this chick didn't work out so he was helping him with like hotel stays, food, essentials, etc. It's important to note that during this time, I was upset because of how much money was being spent and limited him on what he could send his brother a month because it's not my responsibility, so I didn't make him stop, but I limited him. Well, budget cuts went through my hospital two months ago and I was cut, along with 340 other employees. Four wings were closed down, mine being one of them, so I'm currently unemployed. Heath works constantly now. I also got my taxes back. We have three kids. I got back a big chunk of money. Last night, Chris calls and Heath shuts the bedroom door. I assume because the kids were being loud, but I walked in roughly 10 minutes later and see Heath has my debit card in hand, typing in the info on Amazon to buy his brother over $400 worth of crap. Books, board games, playing cards, etc. Nothing he needed. I ripped the debit card out of his hand and asked him what on earth he was doing and he just looks at me like I'm a jerk and asks why I had the nerve to do that. I told him I'm not fishing out $400 worth of crap to his brother and he goes, my brother has nothing to do and this is the only way I can help and said since I got a ton of money, I should be willing to help, especially considering he gets his paycheck Friday and can make up for it. I still said no. He's now saying I'm a controlling jerk. Not the jerk. I'd be getting a new card and lock down the old one, change passwords, everything. If your fiance can't be responsible, then leave. I would stop using a debit card entirely. Credit cards offer much better protection against fraudulent purchases. Yeah, that's because you're giving the bank the powers to turn your life upside down. Not the jerk. You need to have a hard talk with your husband. He needs to stop this behavior or you walk. That money could have been put towards your kid's future instead of giving it to your brother-in-law to set on fire. If he can't see the error in his ways, it's a marriage ender. He's literally taking from his own kids to give to his brother. This is 100% how she needs to put it when talking to him about the issue. That $400 you spent on your brother's non-essential entertainment could have been $133 in a college fund for each of your kids. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her fiance? Please let us know. Nothing's worse than people who try to spend your money on things you don't approve of without your permission. Am I the jerk for leaving a wedding early as a bridesmaid and causing the wedding to get charged a $500 cleanup fee? I, Jane, 21 female, was one of Vanessa's three bridesmaids and her wedding was held at a remote lodge venue up on a mountain. When everyone got to the lodge, we did a dry run of the ceremony and surveyed the place. I assumed that the men would go to their cabin and the women would go to ours and we'd relax before the wedding. Instead, the men immediately headed to the liquor store and the groom and bride's mothers began ordering the bridesmaids to move furniture into place. That night, the women did everything from dragging 250 chairs out of the shed and setting them up to hauling furniture down two flights of stairs and positioning it in other places. 
Because I was the tallest and strongest person in the group, it was mostly on me to haul the larger pieces around, and the mother and mother-in-law of the bride largely stood around talking about details with her. I asked repeatedly if the groom and groomsmen could be called to help, but was told that we didn't need to bother them, and that they're out unwinding before the big day. The father of the bride has a heart condition, and the father-in-law was much older and walking with a cane, so he couldn't help out either. At the end of two very sweaty hours, I had splinters, blisters, I was covered in sweat, but everything set up. During the wedding, I learned that the bride and groom were trying to avoid all of the set-up and takedown fees from the venue. The groom's mother condescendingly patted me on the arm and said that everything would be okay because Jane's our workhorse. After a bit more conversation, I found that the plan was for the bride and groom to leave and then the bridesmaids and groomsmen to stick around doing everything from cleaning up trash to moving the furniture back where we'd gotten it. Toward the end of the party, almost everyone had left and I realized that two of the groomsmen were so drunk that they were going to be useless and it would again be on the bridesmaids to clean up and put all of the furniture back up the stairs. I went to tell the bride goodbye. Judging from her slightly panicked expression and Oh, you're leaving? You're leaving now? Questions. I realized that she definitely expected me to move the furniture back, but didn't want to say anything while surrounded by people. So I left, and my phone blew up as I was driving back down the mountain. The other bridesmaids were texting me, and then Vanessa's mother left me an angry voicemail about how I was bailing on my duties as a bridesmaid. The next day I woke up to a massive paragraph from Vanessa that said it was my fault that they had to pay the $500 cleanup fee because they weren't able to get everything put back in time. So for this, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. If the wedding party is going to be doing this kind of work, you should have been asked in advance. You can't demand your wedding party do heavy labor like that because you want to be a cheapskate. You can ask, but you can't just expect and demand. Dear Vanessa, I'm so disappointed that you expected me to clean up without even asking me. The groomsmen were not even asked to help set up and clearly no one asked them to stay sober enough to clean up, which makes me think that you expected me but no one else to clean up. That's really just hurtful. I thought I was your friend and feeling used really hurts. Am I the jerk for lashing out at my ex-husband for wanting to move away with his girlfriend and my kids? I'm female 35 and my ex-husband, male 34, we divorced two years ago. We have two kids together who are seven and five. We decided to not have the court involved in custody at all with us mutual agreeing that the kids would stay with him and his girlfriend in our old house together on the weekdays and attend school in the suburbs. After we divorced, I moved to the city about 30 minutes away and picked them up every Friday night and spend the weekends with them. For the past two years, co-parenting has run pretty smoothly. We occasionally do things with our kids, have special events or during their birthdays. Sometimes his girlfriend comes along and we're able to have a cordial relationship with one another. Okay, so this is where the dilemma begins. Last Friday, when I came to pick up the kids, he invites me inside to talk. Basically, he says that since he's probably going to work from home indefinitely, he wants to move to his family property with his girlfriend and the kids three hours away in rural Wisconsin. He plans on taking the kids out of public school and have his girlfriend and his sister, who currently lives there, homeschool them. This was a plan he had originally mentioned to me back when we were together, but I had reservations moving to a rural town with my career and being close to good school districts. I am also strongly against homeschooling and believe that it does not prepare kids for proper socialization skills in the future. I want an honest evaluation of whether I'm the jerk in this situation, so I will tell you exactly how it went. As soon as I hear this, I lash out at him, saying that if he wanted to move there so badly, he should just start a new family and leave me with the kids instead. I also tell him that this is a sick attempt to take the kids away from me. At this point, I'm enraged, so I start yelling and ask him if his girlfriend and his sister are even qualified to teach them properly, how they're going to socialize and make friends, and why he would want to change things all of a sudden when our co-parenting was going so well. All he has to say is, I knew you were going to react this way. I told him that I will lawyer up and make it unbelievably hard for him to go through with this. I took the kids for my weekend with them barely unable to compose myself for most of the time. I feel awful for having my kids see me in a state like this, but I want them to grow up knowing that I will fight for them. I took them back to their dad on Monday, and I received a text from him today saying, can you please stop manipulating the kids and thinking I'm some evil monster? Am I the jerk for lashing out in this situation? I asked my kids how they would feel about moving with their dad and his girlfriend away from me, and both of them said they didn't want to. 
Edit, consulted a lawyer this morning. More context. The reason my ex-husband has the kids on the weekdays is so they can remain in the same school as they used to. School ends on 6-17, then it switches to our summer schedule, where I'll have them on weekdays and he'll have them on the weekends. Not the jerk. These are your kids too, and I can't blame you for reacting like you did. Get a good lawyer, ASAP. Not the jerk. This is what parenting agreements are for. It's great you guys were amicable before, but that time has passed and circumstances changed. Moving your kids far away from you to a rural and isolate place is pretty upsetting for anyone, even if you were still in that marriage. While I understand he may want to give them more of an idyllic outdoor childhood and life, your concerns are totally valid and more realistic. Time to go to court. Maybe they can buy a summer home there. You're the jerk for involving your kids at all. Your anger with their father is not their burden, it's yours. Your reaction was unacceptable. If you disagree with his proposal, handle it rationally and under no circumstance should you be bad-mouthing their father to them. If they went home under the impression that he was some kind of monster because you're upset with him, then you messed up. You moved away as well without asking permission, I'm sure. You can keep the same arrangement you have now even if they move three hours away. And for the record, there's a myriad of homeschooling programs out there as well as homeschool communities where kids socialize with other kids every day. And quite honestly, they'll probably get a better education than they would in today's public schools. You went nuclear in your reaction when a rational, civil conversation was possible. You're the jerk. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her ex? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for teaching a new student at my ballet class how to break in her point shoes? I, 18 female, am a professional ballet dancer. I attend classes daily six days out of the week. A younger student has recently joined our Saturday morning class. She's 13. I'll be honest, she's a sweet kid, but clearly one of those kids that the parents threw a tutu and shoes at and expected a star. Still though, she seemed determined to make her parents happy, so me and the older members took her under our wing and tried to help her settle in and learn as much as she could. One issue I noticed very quickly was that she couldn't get over her box. Now this could be down to poorly fitted point shoes, in which case there was nothing I could do to help right now, but I asked to see her shoes before she put them on one morning and saw that they weren't adjusted for her or broken in at all, which, ouch, no wonder she couldn't get over the box. So I helped her break them in, and which, I admit, is a rather intense process for people not used to it. One of our walls has dents in it from all the breaking in. I then taught her the basics of customizing them and helped her to get them as comfortable as possible for her. The class went well and she seemed far more comfortable. The following week, her mother came with her to class and went straight to me, demanding to know why I had destroyed her daughter's shoes and didn't I know how expensive those were and how I had better replace them as she couldn't wear them. I admit I was a little dumbfounded by this and just stared at her for a bit before getting annoyed and telling her that we all break in our shoes and it's the only way to do ballet properly. And yes, I know how expensive they are as I go through a pair of shoes each performance. I told her that she clearly knew nothing about ballet as having unbroken in shoes was going to destroy her daughter's feet and make dancing nearly impossible. And if she was serious about it, then she has to understand that it's an expensive investment. Our ballet master then came over demanding to know what all the noise was about. This mother then said I had ruined her daughter's shoes and how she couldn't afford to buy a new set right now and they had needed to last her daughter at least six months, which good luck with that. They asked to see the shoes and laughed and tried to reassure her that they weren't destroyed, just broken in and showed the how and why this was done. She got embarrassed and upset at this before storming off, saying our class was a joke and how we were trying to sabotage her daughter. I keep thinking about the kid's face and how mortified and upset she had been. Our ballet master insists I did nothing wrong and it was a lesson she should know at 13 if she's serious about dancing. I wonder if she'll come back on Saturday, but I doubt it based on her mother's reaction. Maybe I would have been better pulling her mother to the side after a class and explaining what her daughter needed rather than how I did it. You're the jerk. I'm sure I'll get downvoted. My kid is 14 and a ballerina. She is a junior company member and dances at two studios five to six days a week. She has never, ever had to beat up a pair of point shoes. For reference, she will be the Silver Fairy in our Sleeping Beauty variation this weekend show. None of our company members have. The only time that needs to be done is when you need a new pair of shoes for a performance. You shouldn't have touched her shoes like that. Stepping on the box to soften it a bit, yes, but beating on a wall wasn't necessary. 
Also, there are professional ballerinas who have been dancing for 20 plus years who have never done what you've done to a shoe. If the shank needs to be bent, it should be warmed up with your hands and then put on the foot and bend it. These ridiculous things young dancers do to their shoes are unnecessary. Ripping them open, taking out nails, cutting them, shoe hacks, shaking my head. Edit to add, we work with a master point shoe fitter. You're the jerk. Poor kid either needs some better classes or better fitted shoes because not getting on the box is not solved by breaking them in. Either she's not strong enough and needs more pre-point or those shoes were fitted horrendously. Also, first point shoes could easily last over six months if she's new to it and only doing an hour a week max of bar work. Very minimal in the center, I hope. You need to learn that breaking shoes is very personal and although you might have been trying to be a big sister and helpful, it has potentially stripped the shoes of their strength that she needed for initial support. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the kid's mom? Please let us know. I bet that place is crawling with Karens when it's time to pick the kids up. We can only get one hotel room now? Okay. Many years ago, I used to work for a company that did a lot of traveling. We're talking 12 to 20 hours a day in a truck with another guy, often for 5 to 10 days at a time. When we stopped at hotels, which was not every night, sometimes you slept in the truck, we would get separate hotel rooms so you would have a little bit of personal space. There was a per diem rate, and as long as we kept the hotel rooms under that rate, it never was an issue. Well, after about 15 years of this, the company suddenly decided that separate rooms was costing too much money. We had to share rooms now, regardless of the cost. The job market was fairly good at this point in time, and a few guys basically quit on the spot, and the rest complained a lot. Now, this actually created two forms of malicious compliance. The first one is, instead of looking for a moderately priced hotel, often the drivers would max out the accepted rate. For example, often we would drive out of major cities and stay in the suburbs where hotels and motels were cheaper. Not anymore. You'd find the really nice hotel downtown, and you'd have to pay for parking down there too for the truck, so you expense that also. Then some guys took this policy a step further and would walk into a hotel and say, I'll give you the max rate for this room. They would chat up the hotel desk, explain the situation, and deliberately overpay for the room, spending every cent they could underneath the max rate just to cost the company a bit more money. The second bit of malicious compliance took a bit more conniving behind the scenes. Shortly after this change was made, it just so happened that the head manager of the company needed to head out on one of these trips, which was a relative rarity. Through the backdoor dealings, a few of us managed to get the most obnoxious, smelliest driver on the schedule with him. This guy was a bit of a trip. Nice guy, but didn't like to shower very often. Talk your ear off and refused to turn on the radio. Was really pretty unkempt and liked to watch certain things really loud on the TV in the hotel room. Wasn't the brightest bulb either, but was relatively competent at his job and easygoing otherwise. After sharing a hotel room with him for one night, the manager decided he needed his own hotel room. We made sure everyone in the company knew the manager could not even hack it for more than one day sharing a room and this caused some pretty strong strife. A few more good guys quit. Shortly thereafter, they reinstated the policy of individual hotel rooms. But now the damage had been done. Some of the guys really liked staying downtown, so the parking fees for the trucks went up and the overall cost of the hotel rooms went up too. Am I the jerk for bringing my baby to a child-free wedding? Ah, oh, here we go. My cousin lives a six-hour drive from me and the rest of our family. A few months ago, we all drove over there for his wedding. Due to limited space, no kids were invited to the wedding except the bride's young nieces and nephews. My baby was 10 months old at the time, and I wasn't comfortable leaving him alone in an unfamiliar place with a stranger, which was a babysitter that my other cousins hired for their own kids. So I decided to bring him to the wedding. I wrote on the RSVP that I would be bringing him, but he would be sitting on my lap and I would bring my own food for him. My cousin didn't say anything, so I assumed that he was okay with it. My baby cried at the ceremony, but I quickly took him out of the room. At the reception, I had him with me the whole time in a body carrier. He didn't make much of a fuss, and I thought everything was okay. After the wedding, my aunt, Groom's mom, confronted me and told me that I was rude for bringing my baby without permission. I explained that I wrote on the RSVP what I was planning to do, but my cousin didn't object. She said that my cousin and his bride had a problem with it, but the bride didn't want to start any drama because she doesn't know me well. My other cousin's baby was seven months old at the time, and my aunt said that he had no problem leaving his baby with the certified babysitter, and I should have done the same. 
and some of my cousins were upset because they thought that the groom gave me special treatment by letting me bring my baby and making them leave their kids with a babysitter. I didn't mean to start any drama. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. Your baby literally did the thing that the bride and groom wanted to avoid, disrupt the ceremony. You had plenty of time to find a babysitter or other family member to watch your kid while you went to the wedding but decided that you were just above the rules. Or if you're really not comfortable leaving your baby with a sitter, just don't go to the wedding. Staying home is also an option. No, you don't understand. OP's presence is such a gift that no one minds that her baby interrupted the ceremony. People like you get on my nerves. Child-free means child-free. You do not get to change the rules of someone's wedding because you didn't want to get a babysitter. It's very entitled. You're the jerk. PSA for guests who don't understand how hotels work. A couple of nights ago, I had a late call from a lady and partner who were traveling across the Midwest states by car. They seriously underestimated the distance between towns and cities and after a long day of driving called my hotel to ask about availability. Because it was after 2 a.m., I, with great trepidation, quoted the rates and carefully explained that the rooms would be theirs until 11 a.m. today, so about eight hours. At this point, I moved the phone slightly away from my ear and mentally prepared for the wailing and gnashing of teeth to come, but it didn't. Very nice lady said, that's okay, we just need a couple hours of sleep. It's our fault for not planning our route better. I experienced shock and awe, no screaming fits, no yelling, not even the vaguest suggestion of wanting to call a manager. They arrived about 10 minutes later, walked in with smiling faces, something seldom seen in this circumstance, ID and credit card in hand. I took a moment to decide that, no, this was not me having a stroke or a fever dream. These people were actually real. I immediately upgraded them to the nicest available room, gave them a 15% discount off the price of the standard room and quietly mentioned that I might have forgotten to lock the pool and hot tub area and that for the next few hours I would be far too busy to monitor the pool area cameras. Nice lady's eyes widened as she signed the card, saying, but this says we're in a family suite, and it's less money than you quoted on the phone. I simply smiled, handed her the key, and asked if she needed extra towels as the pool towels had been taken away to laundry so there weren't any available in the pool area. Now the PSA. If you ask politely, communicate what type of room you want, Calmly provide us with any special requests, high floor, ADA, pet room, or whatever you think you want or need without making us beg repeatedly for this info. If you ask instead of demanding, if you refrain from shouting, stomping your feet, or otherwise being a total jerk, if you provide your payment method and ID without us having to forcibly wrestle you to the ground and pry your wallet out of your cold hand, if you refrain from asking the NA if you woke them up, no, you did not wake us up, but you most assuredly upset us. If you follow my recommendations, then you will soon discover the amazing magical powers that all front desk associates wield and double that for the mighty powers of the night audit person. Basically, don't be a jerk and we won't treat you like a jerk. One last thing, hotel days are not the same as calendar days. For explanation, see the thousands of other posts on this sub explaining about rolling the date and check-in and check-out times. Lock your ID away? As you wish. I'm a low runner at a supermarket that's known for not bagging your groceries for you. Due to reasons, I'm almost always on the till, so I'm experienced when it comes to the stupidity that is very common in my store's area. One thing I often do is offer customers a special trolley to help transport heavy and bulky items to and from their cars. These trolleys require the customer to temporarily hand over an ID card to the cashier as insurance so they have to bring these relatively expensive trolleys back. Enter Karen. I don't even remember what she was buying, maybe an outside lounge or something of that like, but she was upset that I'd be taking her driver's license for 10 minutes. As I do for all customers, I tried to assure her that it would be on my person, at this one register, waiting eagerly for her return from downstairs. Nope, not good enough. She demanded I locked it safely away inside the cash drawer, and that's when I realized I had a Reddit story on my hands. With a smile, I showed her as I placed her ID safely nestled among the cash bills in my personal password-protected till. You know, the one that is physically impossible to open mid-transaction. Oh, did I mention that each transaction at this time of day took about five minutes at least? Lo and behold, Madam Karen returns with the fabled trolley, safe and sound. Unfortunately for her, I had just started a big sale. When she came to me, palm extended and ready to receive her favorite plastic card, I took the time to pause my scanning, turn to her with full attention, 
and explained to her that she would have to wait until I finished serving my current customer until she could get her precious card back. Honestly, looking back, I'm not sure who was more upset, Karen or the 12 people in my line who witnessed me stop doing my job just to reassure her that I was, in fact, doing my job as she specified. Regardless, Karen took note and let me finish the sale. I took extra care with this one to make sure no products fell over or got even the slightest bit wrinkled as I rung them up. Time consuming, yes, but isn't a job well done worth it? Am I the jerk for installing a lock on my bedroom door? I'm a college student living with my parents for the summer. Typically, I live in my own on-campus apartment, but my university closed my apartment building for sanitary reasons. I've been living here since early May and contribute. I pay a third of the rent and utilities while I also pick up the chores I used to do. One of my biggest problems living here so far is privacy. Growing up, I had no privacy from my dad. He believes since he pays the bills, he has free access to anywhere in the house. Growing up, he never knocked, would come into the bedroom while I was in it, just never let me feel any semblance of privacy. I've talked to him many times about it, but he's been refusing. The compromise we reached is that he would knock to tell me he's coming in. So he'll knock, then immediately throw the door open. I cannot stand this. So I decided that I would do something about it. My door has never been able to lock. My dad took it out when we moved to this house maybe eight years ago. I fixed this. I found a way to change the door handle and fix the locking mechanism for my door. The next time he tried to come in, he knocked twice, then immediately tried to open the door, but he couldn't. I could hear him messing around with the handle before him asking if the door was locked. I told him I fixed the lock on the door. He started yelling at me through the door. Typical parent crap. I'm letting you live here. This is my house and you do not lock doors in my house. This led to a massive argument through the door. The next time when I came home from work, my door is completely off the hinges. So now I have literally no privacy in my room. My mom and older sister both said I should have just learned to live with this as it's his house. Am I the jerk? Holy cow. Not the jerk. I would stop giving them money. You pay rent. Of course you have a right to lock your door. If possible, find a different place to stay. Unrelated. Everyone deserves privacy, no matter how old or how much rent you pay. My oldest is four years old, and I always ask nicely if she's okay with me entering the room. Of course she doesn't have a lock yet for safety reasons, but she is free to close her door and tell me not to enter if she wants to be alone. Not the jerk. If you're paying rent, you're paying for your space, and thus paying for your privacy. Landlords can't just let themselves in whenever they feel like it, even though you're renting their space. I don't know how your home situation is, but it doesn't sound great. And part of me says, stop paying since he won't treat you like an adult. And the other part of me says, just keep your head down until you can move out. But privacy is not something to be earned. Your dad sounds like a controlling jerk, and I'm sorry that you have to live like that. Not the jerk. Your father is unhinged. Every single person, adult or a kid, requires some semblance of privacy. Your father is using his rule as a way to exert control over you, and this is disgusting. Try and get out of there as soon as you can. Even an apartment you can share with other people and pay for your room. You really don't want to live like this. When you do get your own place, have rules for your father. See how he likes it in your home. Furious guest demands to know why we charged his card for room damage. Duh. I work at a Motel 6, which is franchised and owned by a guy who owns around 75% of Motel 6s in our state, as well as Purple Roof Inn in this state and several neighboring states. He also owns a bunch of Super 7s as well, and our policy is to take credit cards and cash without a security deposit. Well, that might change after this, and I hope so. That policy is insane. I don't know how you can own that many hotels and not realize what a disaster policy it is to not take a security deposit with cash payments, especially considering the brands he owns. So for the past week or so, we've had some sketchy people check into a variety of rooms on various days. We still have our lockdown policies in place concerning the number of people per room. For our two bedrooms, it's four people, exception for families and their kids. Also, housekeepers will not enter stayover rooms so we have linens, towels, etc. at the desk. So in this particular room, I've noticed that it's been having heavy traffic. For our area, that usually means crime. I keep an eye on that room throughout the week and notice that there are five other rooms that the people in that room seem to be familiar with. Like, I'd see them meeting in the parking lot, exchanging packages, and going in and out of each other's rooms, etc. 
So I inform my GM and the other shifts and I keep my eyes on those rooms through the week. They aren't doing anything overt and are generally staying within our rooms except for a noise complaint here and there. About two days before they checked out, I noticed an increase in people on bikes coming and going from those rooms with backpacks, so I'm certain that crime is involved. But as I said, they were keeping within our rules and we've been pretty lax about occupancy cap, but not for like party rooms with 10 people. So I just note what's happening. So they check out in mass and I come in that day and my boss is fuming. She says the main room that I initially took notice of broke the toilet. I thought, oh, okay, probably the handle or maybe the toilet seat. But no, they broke the entire toilet in half. How? I do not know. The toilet tank cover was shattered in the shower. Again, I do not know how. Their headboards were busted off the wall and the water leaked into three adjoining rooms, not occupied, and caused damage. She then said that two of the other rooms were tattooing and spilled ink all over the floor and on the beds. So now those linens are trash and we cannot rent those rooms out until the flooring is replaced. One of the rooms had hair dye all over it, on the beds and the towels, so those are trash now. And the rooms were trashed, like multiple days of food containers stacked around the trash can trashed, so those rooms cannot be rented until we can clean and air them out. And of course, they smoked in all of them. My boss called the owner and he blew up on her, asking her why were we renting to people like that, like we can tell. He asked if she got payment for the damage and of course she didn't because they paid cash. He flipped out and she reminded him of his policy which sort of shut him up. I walked in just as she was hanging up. So I checked the guy's stay history and he did have a card on file for one of those days. So my boss told me to run it for $500 and surprisingly it went through. So that cheered her up a bit. So a bit later on in my shift, the guy calls me screaming and asking why we charged his card. I calmly explained it was for room damages and he screams, what damages? Like really? Come on, you know what I'm talking about. I say the documented damage from the room that we're reporting to the police as well, and that shuts him up. He hung up on me and he hasn't called back. Of course, we didn't report anything to the police, but we did document everything. The next day, one of the people from those rooms tried to check back in, and my boss was like, nope, but pretended to get their ID for DNR. Needless to say, all those rooms are also PERMA-DNR. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.